Should I say something? Welcome back, everyone. If you could grab a chair, uh, we have a treat for you now. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Jeannie Roberts from um, the Appleton Fox Cities League. She will be a moderator for our panel discussion, Youth Engagement in the Democratic Process, How League Can Support Their Work. Jeannie is a past president of the League of Women Voters of Appleton Fox Cities. <laughs> <laughs> a former DEI chairperson for her own league and is the cur current co-chair of the state's Community Alliances Committee. Jeannie, thank you so much for being our moderator. And thank you for asking me. I just feel so honored to be up here with these, with these young women. They're just inspirational. So um, I'm going to speak very little because you don't want to hear me. The League of Women Voters began as a mighty political experiment by the suffragists who spoke out and stood up for what they believed in. The second wave of feminists did much the same. Now I am very excited to introduce you to four young people who are part of the next wave of activism. Um, each of our panelists includes a complete bio in your packet that you can read and be as inspired as I am. Madeline McDermott is a former League of Women Voters of Appleton Fox City's Making Democracy Work Youth Award and a Clean Energy Fellow for the Wisconsin Conservation Voters. <laughs> Ishani Buddy has participated in both Wisconsin Youth in Government and been a diversity intern for the city of Appleton. <laughs> Ivy Everard is Vice President of UWO Fox City's Political Science Student Organization. And Mandeep Kalika is a former youth governor of Wisconsin and an intern at the Outagamie County District Attorney's Office and she's jo joining us online today. So I'm going to start with um, asking Mandeep, and then each of you can follow. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and what are some of the areas that you are passionate about? Hello, everyone. My name is Mandeep Kalaika. Uh, this upcoming school year, I will be a freshman at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And a few of the areas I'm passionate about include ending gun violence, um, climate change, and social justice. And climate change I'm passionate about because I think it's a huge issue um, that our generation is advocating for mitigating the climate impacts that are affecting um, people all across the world. I think it's an issue that a lot of people um, like underestimate the impact of, but is something that is going to impact everyone eventually um, that global leaders need to act on um, together and very soon. I believe that gun violence is important to stop because no one should have to go through the experience of losing a loved one to violence like that, especially students or teachers or parents. Um, and I believe that social justice is important to ensure equity across every area of society. Um, so that's a little bit about what I'm passionate about. Thank you. Ivy, do you want to go next? There we go. <laughs> My name's Ivy Everard. I am a sophomore over at UWO Fox Cities right now. I am currently the vice president of our political science club on campus. One of the things that I feel most passionately about is just engaging young voters and getting them out to vote. Um, I care a lot about just the institutional barriers that are there for when people are first time voters and just voting in general. So 
that would probably be the biggest thing that I focus on. Thank you. Ishani? Hi, I'm Ishani, and I'm going to be a sophomore at Carleton College in Minnesota. Um, I'm interested in majoring in both anthropology and sociology, and then also biology, um, and then a minor maybe in one or the other. Um, and then I'm really passionate about ensuring that there's diversity in every field and, you know, like aspect of our community that we come across. I feel like having a representation of all of the voices in a community is really important to actually further and develop all of the ideas. Um, and I don't know, like I feel like I've seen a lot of growth, especially like in my college, in my high school, and I wanna see that in our community and everywhere else. Thank you. Madeline? Hi, uh, my name's Madeline McDermott. Um, and this past year I've been working as an intern um, with Wisconsin Conservation Voters, and I'm also a barista at Starbucks. Uh, we are in the midst of a union push. Our election is on June 16th, <laughs> so stay tuned for that. Hopefully we win and it makes the news. Um, I began to do community organizing um, around climate change and the school strikes for climate. Um, and from there, I got really interested in resource extraction and in the way that it affects marginalized communities. Um, this past year, I've been devoting a lot of my time uh, to union organizing um, and just making sure that every worker like knows the voice they have and that they can like act, act collectively for that. So yeah, I just try and help out where I can. Thank you, Madeline. I'm going to ask you to go again. Okay. What inspired you to become so civically engaged? And then within that, what motivated you to become a leader within your passions? Um, yeah, so I began with uh, climate organizing because I really uh, care about nature and also as someone who believes in God, you know, that's kind of how I see God is through nature. Um, so that's definitely where that started. Um, and I think just seeing like other uh, young leaders really allowed me to like see myself in that role. It's like, oh, if this person can do this, then I can do this. So like with Greta uh, Thunberg and the School Strikes for Climate, uh, you know, she was my same age at the time. Um, and, you know, we had like fairly similar lives. I mean, I don't live in Sweden, but you know. Um, <laughs> and I was like, okay, if she can like take action um, and like help her community, I can too. And also, um, with like union organizing, uh, before we filed um, for a union election, the baristas in Buffalo did. Um, and seeing someone file for an election and seeing someone win really allowed us to like see that that was possible and actually start making it happen. Thank you, Ishani. Okay, um, for me, a big reason that I'm civically engaged and want to be a leader in my community is because of my mom. Um, ever since I was a little kid, she's been very civically engaged and she always promotes like cultural awareness and diversity, inclusion, and you know, um, volunteering in the community. And so I've had the opportunity to volunteer since I was like five years old. I'd go with her everywhere. I remember co going to like Indus and literally sitting around in the banquet hall and like, making all of these little like decorations and trying my best to help at the food stalls. Um, and so that's really pushed me to keep volunteering in my community and stay engaged. Can we give a shout out to Ishani's mom? <laughs> <laughs> Ivy? Yeah, so for me, I think the biggest part in just starting with my volunteers and was I was working well I wasn't working quite yet I started volunteering with NAMI Fox Valley and from there I started working with young adults in their support group programs and then I eventually went on to work at a, a crisis place in the Fox Cities and doing that kind of work just kind of showed me just all of the gaps that we have in a lot of our systems and recognizing that um, like mobilizing is the best way and the only way to change things and so getting involved in those protests in those rallies um, and just continuing to do that stuff and then as for UW Fox Cities I would say I wasn't really looking for a leadership position on that it was just kind of like when there's a need someone needs to kind of come forward thank you and um, Mandeep 
Uh, so I would definitely say the first time I was sort of inspired to get civically engaged was through the youth and government organization. Um, I joined this organization in eighth grade and I was very shy and I rarely shared my opinion. But there I found this space where there was a lot of people who are passionate about political issues and I was encouraged to share my opinion. So eventually through this program, I found my voice and I was able to share my opinion about issues that mattered to me. Um, so I would definitely say that what inspired me to sort of become a leader was the idea that I'd be able to play a small role in helping other people discover their voices sort of as I did through this program. Thank you. Ivy, I'm going to ask you next. What do organizations like the League of Women Voters need to know about the needs of the next generation of future leaders? I think just that they're out there, like looking at people that are organizing rallies, looking at people that are organizing protests, and just having those opportunities available and having people available to do that mentorship piece and really guide people along in effective organizing and things like that. Ishani? I really agree with Ivy. Building off of that, I feel like a big thing to do would be reaching out to you know those people who are like already engaged in the community and seeing how you can also get involved with that. And um, I don't know, like a lot of young people are organizing their own protests. Like especially, um, I like know a couple of people like Jeff Messer. He organized a lot in the past few years. And I feel like just reaching out and seeing what's going on in the news with um, younger people, or even reaching out to like schools principals, would help a lot. Madeline. Um, I think that it's important to recognize like everyone's capacity, you know. So um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to um, show up to the uh, uh, talk about like disability rights. But like another point of that is that everyone on, everyone has like limited energy, and for some people, it's less than others. And I think. You know, there are a lot of people who are full-time students and maybe they also work or they're full-time workers. And I think it's really important um, to just make things accessible and meet people where they are. Like someone might be able to attend a rally, that doesn't mean everyone's going to be able to organize one. And that's okay. And there are also, there's artists, there's writers, um, there's organizers. There's a lot of ways to get involved. And I think it's really important to just talk to people about what they're interested in and see like, how you can work with them towards justice. Thank you, and Mandeep? Um, I think everyone else sort of nailed what I was gonna say as well, um, that there are people out there, especially young people who are organizing changes about whatever they're passionate about through a lot of different means. And I think technology is definitely helping and supporting them through that. Thank you, I'm gonna start with Ishani this time. And Ishani, how can the League of Women Voters become more relevant, accessible, and welcoming to young people? Um, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, like I, as a student, did not really know about opportunities such as being a diversity intern or being in youth and government until friends and family and individual, individuals around me would mention it. And I feel like being surrounded with those types of people was why I got the opportunity and realized that I was passionate about such things, but I feel like there's so many other people out there who would really be happy and welcoming of the idea of being passionate and being supported by the women of the League of Women Voters. Um, if you like maybe reached out to schools or to activists that you already know and saw how you could um, maybe like promote programs that you already know about, like youth and government, or like being an intern, or any other opportunities like that. Thank you. Mandeep? Um, so I think it would be beneficial for the League of Women's Voters to continue to keep like a strong online presence because nowadays a lot of things are done through technology and events are organized through technology. So I think um, keeping a strong online presence both on social media and just online generally through a website is very important and is very beneficial. Um, and I think also building off what Ishani said, um, reaching out to other organizations that are doing work to become civ civically engaged, as well as working with these events to host more events like these, or working with these organizations to host more events like these, and potentially fundraisers um, to help engage young people. Thank you, Ivy. 
I would just continue on that. I think it's really that technology piece of it is very important. That's, I mean, how people keep in contact. That's how we view all of our information. I also just think reaching out to those universities or schools and kind of getting your foot in the door there is a great way to just meet with young people that are looking to be engaged. I think another thing that I was also thinking about just in Appleton in particular is like Houdini Plaza is a place where we frequently see people gathering to promote change. So even just stopping by with that and kind of explaining what the league does and who you are and how you can be in support of that could go a really long way. Thank you, and Madeline. Yeah, um, I definitely agree with everything that was said before. I think it's really important to like go to places where young people are gathered, like schools, and just explain who you are, as opposed to just like expecting them to come to you. And it's it's great if people do and they find your their way to you. Um, but I think it's really important to like do outreach there. I also think another thing um, that's worth noting is like you know when you go to a protest and you see people, um, it's great that people are protesting and it's a very cathartic experience. But like a one-time protest often isn't enough to make change. You really have to be like committed to it and to make it like a sustainable effort. And I think that just like explaining that to a lot of people who do want to get involved is important. It's like, this is great, but how can we make this, like, how can we keep the work going, you know? And just giving them resources about the organization and about how you've created change in the past to like get people interested in being involved. Um, I think another thing, like going back to what I was saying earlier, about how there are so many different ways to be involved. I think um, like having more opportunities for artists or people who write um, just to like express how they feel about all of the issues in our country um, would be like a really great way to get people involved. You know, there's a lot of great artists in Appleton um, and I know a lot of them are interested in community organizing. They're just not exactly sure how to use the gifts they have for that. Thank you. One of my favorite buttons I have, it says, marching is not enough, vote. <laughs> Mandeep, I'm going to have you go first this time. Can you give us your take on your generation? What are your thoughts on your generation? Um, so I think our generation, I would say the first thing is we are very involved with te technology, especially with recently COVID and transitioning to online school and having to figure out um, talking to people online versus in person. I think that basically our everyday lives are a lot different than they have been for people in the past because of technology with social media and websites and the easy in access we have to information. And while this can help us get access to the news or organize quickly, it may also um, not be as beneficial, but I think there's many ways that we utilize it that make it beneficial, such as again, um, using it to organize or using it to get information. And I think another thing that's important to mention is I think a lot of people in our generation are passionate about social issues, but maybe don't know how to take action and continue to take action, sort of like Madeline mentioned in the past. Um, and I think that's something that is because we're bombarded with so much information, but a lot of times we don't know how to take action to make change based upon that information. Thank you. Madeline, do you want to answer that one? Um, yeah, I think that everything that um, Andy mentioned was like really important and I definitely agree with all that. I think, um, you know, I would just, the only thing I have to add to that is to reiterate um, that everyone's capacity is different. You know, um, a lot of people are just really tired um, because of everything we've experienced in the past few years. And I think it's important to just like meet people where they're at. I also, yeah, I mean, not everyone can be a full-time activist and that's okay. It's just um, important to like loop people in where you can and let them know um, how they can make change, even if it is just voting and like just voting in national elections and local elections and stuff like that. Thank you, Ishani. Yeah, building off of um, Madeline and Mandeep, 
I feel like it's really important to use social media or, you know, like electronics in a way to reach young people because I know that a lot of the time people, as Madeline said, are passionate about a subject but they don't have an outlet to make a change. And um, what an example I've seen of that actually is in, the co in my college. I've only been there for a year, but um, it's really easy to get involved because all of the clubs will email everyone in the student body and they'll provide events and be like, come get to know us, come see this, it's free, you don't even have to commit anything. And then once you go, you realize, I really want to do this. I'm already passionate about this, but they're making a change. And that's how I got involved in so many things at my school. I really um, enjoy like listening to other people talk about their passions and I feel like that also makes me more passionate. And so again, like piecing together what they both said, like reaching out to others. And I mean, I wouldn't see any problem with getting a couple emails from the League of Women Voters, like as a student, you know? We've got your email. You'll be getting them. <laughs> um, so for this question, I'm thinking about a study that I actually read that was done by the Pew Research Center. And they were really focused on kind of Gen Zers and what they're looking for out of politics and things like that. And the big thing is it's a lot of single issues, which makes sense. And we're seeing a lot of activism happening, which is great. Um, but it is the part of like getting young people to the polls where I think there is a particular challenge. Um, and something that I've been working on like in my own schoolwork is really in not only engaging young people, but showing them how to do it. Voting th for the first time is scary if you don't know how to register or pre-register or do any of those things. So being available for once the protest is over, how to continue that momentum, I think is a big piece of it. Thank you, and I, this last question, I think you've probably answered it, but I'm gonna ask anyways, because it's on my list. How does the League of Women Voters discover more about and support programs of young adult activists such as yourselves? Is it going to be right away? All right. I think just, you know, utilizing social media, you'll see when events are. You can see who's organizing those things. Again, just reaching out to those schools and universities, seeing if they have people that are active in student government, active in a political science club, active in their environmental clubs, things like that is a great place to start. Ishani? Yeah, I also agree with Ivy. Like, I really just think we've all already said, I mean, I, at least I know that everyone's covered what I already have to say about you guys um, supporting young activists and their programs, um, really just reaching out. And you've already heard about a ton tonight, like, you know, being an intern, opportunities that you guys can offer, and also youth in government, stuff like that. And even re reaching out to universities and colleges, because I'm sure there's plenty of colleges that don't have programs and be really love they would love to hear from you. Madeline? Yeah, I definitely agree that everything was said there, that was said there. Um, I also think just um, like events in Appleton that a lot of young people attend, like I mentioned artists earlier, there's a lot of musicians here. Um, like I know uh, my friend Levi Besaw puts on like a yearly, well, it's going to be a second annual, but like a music festival and they do, um, fundraising for like LGBT organizations and there's also Food Not Bombs there which is like a mutual aid organization. Um, so I think just like really connecting with people and I think like music and art is a really good way to do that. I also um, want to like reiterate what everyone said about social media. Like I have a Facebook the only reason I downloaded Facebook in the first place was because of organizing, um, because Facebook events is like everything for finding protests and marches and, you know, so on, so on. Um, so I think, you know, just uh, staying uh, in tune with what everyone's doing and also just like following up with people uh, to make sure they have the resources to keep going. Um, I also just want to say uh, this Saturday, is going to be Appleton's second annual Pride um, at Jones Park. So if anyone would like to, you know, show up there, maybe wear your League of Women Voters button or just, you know, be supportive. Uh, a friend of high, a friend of mine from high school, Emily Ninehouse, is organizing it. So it's a lot of younger people there. And Mandeep. Um, again, I think that everyone else covered a lot of what I was going to say. Um, I definitely think that hosting more events like these and engaging with them um, to promote community engagement is super important as well as using social media. Um, and I think that reaching out to schools would be a really great way um, to let young adults know about opportunities such as Ashani mentioned as well. 
Okay, and before I turn it over for questions, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open it up to the four of you for any, anything you'd like to say that we haven't asked that, that you'd like to say. Anything? Okay. Then why don't we open it up for questions from the audience? What enthusiasm do you have and what barriers do you see for people in your cohort, you Gen Zers, uh, to run for office? Did you hear her? To become elected officials. To answer that question, I think it's a lot of things. I think it has to do with just busy school schedules. If somebody's pursuing higher education and if they aren't, like what does that person's work schedule look like? I think like I know for myself and a lot of people my age are constantly just being asked to do more and more and more with less time. So then when it comes to that capacity piece of it as well, like what is the best for your own health versus running for office, which I think we definitely need more young people in office. It's just allowing the supports to be there for somebody to actually run as a candidate. I totally agree with Ivy. I feel like there's a lot of you know requirements that are set to get to certain levels in life. Like let's say um, I'm interested in pre-med and I have to get my undergraduate degree. I also in that time have to shadow, get a job, um, like look at other doctors, look at other fields, say why do I actually want to do this, and then also do research, intern, and maybe take a gap year, study for the MCAT. Like on top of this, like it, in any field, I feel like there are requirements to get forward in life, and it's just like adding on and on, and there's so much more that needs to be like um, done that I feel like that's a big barrier, but also like providing support and mentors would be a big help in getting more young people to run for office. Yeah, I mean, I am enthusiastic about young people running for office, and I think that there's a good chance that more young people will. I've seen a lot of younger people running for office in local elections these past years, and that's something that really encourages me. Yeah, I definitely would say, like, capacity and time are barriers, and another one um, is just, like, income. Um, it takes a lot of money to run for office, you know, even if it is just a local election, you got to print flyers, you got to make buttons. Um, and I think people just having the resources to know like how they can get funding to run for office or how they can like fundraise would really help people. Mandeep, did you want to speak to this? Yeah, um, so I would definitely be enthusiastic about young people running for office. I think that um, in like our legislature, for example, there's a lot of older people in office and maybe not so much representation of young people's voices, which I think should definitely, there should definitely be more young people's voices represented. Um, however, I do agree with Ishani and Madeline and Ivy that a lot of young people may not have like the capacity because they're so busy with everything else going on in their lives, like getting an education and as well as sort of adding on to what Madeline said, just that they don't have maybe the resources or like the network in order to be able to run for office, maybe a large barrier. I have a question. Thank you for being here and y'all are so brave because at your age, I don't think I would have been able to do what you're doing. So kudos, first of all. <laughs> Super impressive, all of you are. Um, I have a question for you. What can we do to add or enhance our meetings to make it more relevant, to make them more relevant, accessible? I heard art and music. Um, are there any like, um, or different mediums that we could, you know, incorporate into our meetings that would be more appealing? I had something, um, <laughs> now it's gone. Oh, okay, sorry, I remember now. Um, I know that I uh, personally have attended a few um, League of Women Voters meetings about like environmental justice. Um, and I know that sometimes those meetings were on weekdays at like one or 2 p.m. 
and that's not something that a lot of people can do. So I think just like, you know, utilizing like doodle polls and stuff like that, which I'm sure you already do, um, to see like when people are available, uh, maybe have like alternate times. So like, oh, maybe a weekend because, you know, there are people who work weekends. There are people who weekends are the only times that work for them or just like later in the evening. Does anyone else have any? Anyone else? No? Okay. Thank you. I'm Lisa Hanirom with Dane County League, and I, I love Dorothy's question. I was going to ask something similar, but since she already asked about running for office, I'll change it. And I'll, I'll go back to uh, someone made the comment that organizing is the only way to get things done. And then we heard the mayor say this morning, what am I going to say when the league calls? And so I'm wondering, to what extent does your um, mobilizing and organizing mean showing up at, for example, local uh, meetings, like city council meetings, and making your voice heard? Because I, I'm a newly elected official, and I would love to be able to think, oh my gosh, what am I going to say when the Gen Z folks call me? That's a really good question. I think in particular when it comes to local elections and just local offices as well is the accessibility piece of it and just being really, really open and transparent as to how people can get in contact with you. Like I remember even just voting in our last election for city stuff and it was really hard for me to find accurate information about people. So if it's that hard to do that, how hard is it to find for like your mayor office, things like that. Um, Something that maybe I would encourage is like doing like a Facebook Live. All of those kinds of actions can be really helpful in getting in contact with Gen Zers. Anybody else want to answer that one? No, Ivy did such a good job. She covered for everybody. Who's next? Any other questions? Uh, I heard all of you say that social media was how to connect with the youth or Gen Z. What do you mean when you say social media? <laughs> I would honestly say anything. Like, I use Facebook, I use Twitter, I use Instagram, and I feel like one big way would be to find the programs themselves that a lot of youth follow. Like. I've said so many times already, like youth in government or something like that, and then reach out to that platform itself so that they can then advertise the League of Women Voters and say, hey, this is something you might be interested in. Something like that because um, otherwise they're not, again, going to automatically seek every, like not, not everyone's going to automatically seek you guys out, um, but I think that everyone should know about you. So. Yeah, I think um, I'd probably say that Instagram and Twitter are like the biggest ones. Um, I'm on Facebook because of political organizing, and I think personally because of like Facebook events, it's a really good platform for that, but there's not a lot of younger people on there. Um, there's also TikTok, which I'm sure you've all heard of. <laughs> I think that's um, a bit trickier, and I think um, it's not a great medium for getting like information about an organization like yours out there. Um, like I think, I think it can be used in a good way um, a lot of times, but I think it's like trickier to do, and especially if it's not like a younger person taking that initiative, it might not reach the right audience or come across the right way. <laughs> <laughs> Ivy or Mandeep? You'll go in Mandeep? Okay. Yeah, um, so for me personally, I know um, the social media that I'm most like used to seeing um, organizations sort of promote and um, organize on is definitely Instagram. I think that a lot of times organizations are able to post like their meeting this day and it's this event. Um, and then other people usually post it on like their stories, which helps other people to see that event. And I know that a lot of organizations that I personally have been involved in, I've seen on Instagram on like friend stories. Um, so that's a great way to get out there into the community, um, especially with Gen Z. Thank you. Other questions for this incredible group of young women? Dorothy?
since, since you are the future, I'm always interested how young people would like to paint the future. So what changes, improvements do you for look to, plan to work for, and indeed insist upon in this country 10 years from now with regard to equity, diversity, inclusion, and justice? Where do we have to go? What, do, what image do you want our country to have internally and internationally? I mean, I personally want to see more women in STEM. I want to see more people of color in STEM. Like, that's a big thing that I want to see. I want to see a lot more people, like, a lot more women in the careers that you don't usually see them in. Like, why? Why not, you know? <laughs> we should be in them. Um, and I think that if in the future I got to see that, that would be amazing. I think that would be, like, the biggest thing. That would probably make me cry. <laughs> Yeah, I just think more women in positions, more women of color in positions. I really am looking towards getting things environmentally done and how that impacts just daily life. And I guess when I look to the future, I want to look at more efforts in cleaning up the planet and making that sustainable. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, you said a lot very perfectly. <laughs> so now I'm kind of like, yeah, I guess that's where I see things in, in 10 years. Thank you. I would you. hope to. Thank you. Madeline? Um, yeah, I mean, it's almost, sometimes especially with like environmental issues, it is hard to be optimistic about the future, but I also, I think it's really important to try and envision it and to work towards it. Um, and, you know, I'd like to just see a future where everyone is safe and happy, you know, where everyone can have a good job, where they can have affordable housing, you know, because when people have, um, you know, what they need to live a good life, they're going to be a lot more empowered towards change. Um, I think another really important thing um, with environmental issues is respecting tribal sovereignty. You know, um, we have line five that goes through. <laughs> Um, that that goes through northern Wisconsin um, and originally went through the Bad River Reservation. It is uh, it has a proposed reroute, but it still goes through their um, treaty territory. And I think it's really important in the environmental movement to you know listen to the people who know the land. Um, and I think that in order to have um, environmental justice and to have a future where we have clean water, where we have a safe climate, uh, we really just need to like take a step back um, and listen and also to oppose these resource extraction projects with like everything we have because it's connected to everything. Mandeep? Um, I'd like to see a country that's welcoming to everyone and where everyone has equitable resources and also um, a country where children are not afraid to go to school because of um, shootings and because of tragedies that have happened in the community. Um, so those are some things that I would like to see. Thank you. Other questions? add on a little bit more if that's all right. I think that I also want to see a lot more systematic changes happen. Things that continue to stay in place, measures that are taken for gun violence, environmental issues, things like that. So really doing that work and getting it changed so it's long lasting. Thank you. Uh, yes, I have a question. You guys talked about um, looking for mentors or supporters. What are you looking for in a mentor or people supporting you? And how would you like to connect to them? How would you like to have the interface with them? I'm going to pull out some psych terms here. Okay, so I actually recently just learned in my psych class about the zone of proximal development, and it's essentially where, you know, there's a knowledgeable other, and they help pull you out of the zone where you can just learn things on your own, and they pull you into the zone where you're able to learn past your, like, own limit of knowledge with, like, tools of knowledge or knowledgeable others, and I believe that a mentor could be anyone who just has more knowledge than the person themselves who you are, like, helping. So it could be any one of you, honestly. I don't think that there should be any like limit to who a mentor could be. Um, just anyone who has 
passionate about the field, has knowledge about the field, and knows resources to a higher extent than the person that they are talking to. Thank you. Mandeep? Um, uh, so adding on to what Shai said, I think that a mentor could be anyone. And something I think I would look for in a mentor is just general like life advice because they've probably been through like a lot more of life experiences than I have and generally just like different ones. So I'd love to hear about like a mentor's life experiences versus my own and just how their story impacts their community. Thank you. Ivy or Madeline? Yeah, I, um, I agree with what everyone said about like who a mentor is. Um, in terms of like getting in contact with these people, I think that, you know, every time you reach out to someone and you tell them about what the League of Women Voters does and has done, you should also be offering some sort of assistance, you know, you should be like, this is the way that we've done this and this is how it's helped us. If you want to learn more, like we're here to do that for you, you know. Thank you. Did you have something to add, Ivy? Yeah, I think just what everyone is saying, I think are just great steps. Also, when you have people that have a specific interest, so like if somebody is very interested in art, is very interested in writing, even if that's not necessarily your forte, helping out with that and being like, how can I support and how can I engage with you in this? Thank you all. Other questions? Yes, Ernestine Miles from Dane County. Okay. Uh, could you tell me how you would approach um, dealing with the proliferation of guns in the United States? And how do, do you see it affecting you in any way? Anybody want to try that one? <laughs> Mandeep, are you? Um, sure. So I think this is an issue that I'm super passionate about. Um, and I know a lot of times, even like my friends are sometimes scared to come to school because of like all the tragedies we've heard of recently. And I think some of the big steps to changing that is ensuring that there are adequate background checks and resources for mental health um, provided in order to become like a gun owner and ensuring those guns don't fall into the wrong hands. Um, and I think it's important for us to place these measures in through like legislation, um, in addition to kind of creating a culture where you're not scared at school to come there um, because education is a right and you shouldn't have to be scared of something like that happening. So we should probably ensure that first, um, guns don't fall into the wrong hands. And secondly, that people have access to like mental health resources um, that they need. Thank you. Yeah, I think just background checks is a big piece of it. I think limiting just how much somebody can even amass in weapons. Um, and I even think of like, with like school shootings that have been happening, which is very tragic and sad, and it does make me scared to go into public spaces. And I think everyone's feeling that right now. But I also think about just the injuries that happen. I mean, toddlers get shot with guns all the time because they're not locked up properly and we don't prioritize safe gun practices and making sure that that's a piece of if you are having gun ownership that you are responsibly locking it up. Yeah, building off of Ivy, um, I was watching a video the other day about this and can someone please tell me why it takes two years for someone to learn how to drive and they have to go through everything, but you can just sign up for an assault rifle at 18. Yeah. Like, I still have not learned how to drive, I'm gonna be honest with you. <laughs> like, I actually, I have, but like, I'm still getting through the process of getting my license because I started late. I'm almost 19 and I still have not learned how to drive, but I could now purchase an assault rifle, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's a hard question, um, and that's not something that, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll show up to a rally in support of gun control, but that's not something I've been an organizer in, you know? Um, so I really can't say all that much, but I do know um, that something needs to change, and part of that um, is within our, like, legislature and making sure 
that we have like common sense laws um, to make sure that there's like safe and responsible gun ownership. And I think another piece of that is just acknowledging um, that there are a lot of white supremacists in this country, there are a lot of fascists in this country, um, and just understanding, you know, the p type of people that commit these acts of violence and where that starts. Because I know there's a lot of discussion around like critical race theory and all of that, and a really important um, step to like ending white supremacy in our country. It starts with education and it also starts with like systematic change. So I just think that's another part of the discussion that I am more educated on that I would like to add. Thank you, Madeline. Yeah, we have an online question. It's, it's from I, Joy. Yes. Yes, it's from me. Thank you. Um, you know, many of us are involved in education and issues advocacy in our local leagues, uh, particularly our local league, Lake Michigan Region, is, uh, works in the area of um, environment and climate change as it relates to the lake. Where do we connect? You've, you've advised us to use social media, but where do we connect with people from your generation to uh, get invite them at, on scholarships to attend our events or invite them to uh, take advantage of a, a paid internship in a substantive area. Do you have any suggestions of how, because we usually are doing it through adults and teachers, but I'm wondering how we connect with you folks directly. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I mean, already networking through adults and teachers I think is very important, um, but I would also say that maybe offering it as a thing for colleges to advertise would be really important because um, while high schools do offer that, there are also some people who, again, like are not at high school, they are homeschooled or something like that. And maybe they're going to college, university, like a school for the first time, and they're looking through like, <coughs> I did not end up going to Madison, but I did see the um, way that you could apply for a scholarship. And it was like scrolling through a list, um, at least like when I was applying and, um, researching that way and they had like a database somewhere and I feel like just advertising this to colleges and then also like through social media as we said before like through youth programs um, that you already know like are active that could also probably connect you to other ones like maybe even it doesn't even have to be like a political one like there are probably people who are in like who are like politically um, passionate but also like in HOSA or um, in DECA or something like that you know uh, just getting into all of the programs would, I think, be really beneficial. Yeah, I would just um, say the same thing as really getting involved with those universities, getting involved with those schools. I think, you know, like being at those events where there are a lot of young people and just even just having that table and explaining what you do and then also what those other opportunities are if someone is interested. Um, I think for my own role, because I've worked in mental health programs, is like places like Youth Go. I know that um, the Ascent Initiative is like around the area and they do a lot for like young adult housing. So those are a lot of people that you could be reaching out to as well, is who's in those programs. Mandeep, did you want to answer that one? Um, sure, I think that Ishani and Ivy covered mostly what I was going to say as well. Um, I think that just reaching out to organizations in the community is super important, um, as well as universities. Um, and I think that maybe advertising more in like online spaces as well, um, such as Instagram I mentioned previously, would help a lot with connecting with young adults. Madeline, did you want to answer that one? You're okay? They All right. Did a good job. Thank All you. Right. Thanks very much. Other questions? Yeah, I, Ivy, this is spinning off your mental health services comments. Are there mental health services that you had in high school and or college that were good examples? Or are there, are there services that you'd really like to see? Both general benefit mental health services and then alluding to this thing about the violent tendencies, identifying and and uh, taking care of potential shooters before they shoot. Um, I apologize, I'm just, 
just for a little bit of clarity, so are you just kind of like asking about like what kind of mental health programs do you think would just benefit the community in general? Yeah, um, so I'm just thinking about like the K through 12 level. So my involvement is I was in a program where I went into high schools and we had other like young adults or people that had closely graduated who talked about their journeys with mental health. Um, I know that the Fox Cities is really great in providing, they have teen support groups. They've got a ton of peer run support groups, which I've run. And then we also have a peer run program and Wisconsin's a really unique state because we have four of these, five actually now, of these houses that are across the state where people can come and stay from five to seven days if they're experiencing crisis or distress where they're met with peers and they're able to go and continue on with life and go to their appointments and really just focus on their mental health needs there. So I think that in this state we're doing pretty well. Um, I think that those mental health services need to come from community-based things. So it's not just what's happening in school, it's also like, where do you go and are you supported after you're done with school? Do you have an arts program? Do you have something that you can go and do at the Y? Things like that, I think, go a long way. Um, I think a really big thing would be promoting all of the things that Ivy just said, because I, in high school, <coughs> well, I like, myself knew about such resources because I was working with people like that, um, like all of the people who wanted to provide the resources themselves. Um, I know many people who had to um, reach out and do a lot of research themselves if they wanted the help, but sometimes they did not want it, or they just didn't know how, where to start, and parents were not supportive. And I feel like a big thing also, in a way, would be even having more counselors. I feel like counselors in high schools and um, universities are so overwhelmed, like at my college. Um, I think that they do like a pretty good job of being very um, aware of the fact that, or not aware, let me think about my phrasing for a second. Um, they're very open about mental health awareness. And I think that that's something really important because at my high school, while I think that there was a certain group of people who were very open about it, um, I feel like at any high school in general, it would never hurt to be more aware, to talk more about it, to get more counselors, to get more um, resources like posted online on the school website, anything like that, you know? Even like sent out to parents. I know that privacy is a really big thing for a lot of students and offering a resource where they do not have to share any of their journey with anyone else until they're comfortable to would also be amazing. Yeah, I think the Fox Valley does um, a pretty good job when it comes to mental health resources. I think um, a lot of it is just making sure that um, therapists and other people who work with mental health, like counselors, are just like culturally aware. You know, everyone has a different family structure. They have different experiences growing up, and everyone's going to need different things out of therapy or counseling. Um, I think another thing is just being like trauma informed. Um, because that's the root of like a lot of people's problems. Um, and we have to acknowledge, you know, the world we live in, we have to acknowledge that climate change has mental effects, um, violence and school shootings has mental effects and just understanding um, how those affect like kids and being able to say like, I understand that that's a problem. You know, there are a lot of people who have, who are like pre disposed to like anxiety or depression or other like mental health conditions I'm one of them um, but there are also people who like recognize the very real issues that we're dealing with and have like big emotions because of that um, and that's just another thing to know I also think um, whenever you talk about like who a potential shooter is or like stopping a potential shooter beforehand um, it's important to like think of the biases you have um, and make sure that you're not saying like, oh, well, there's this one person, they might be predisposed to violence because they're like a minority or they're poor or so on and so forth. Um, like one example of that is there were a lot of school cops uh, that were added after um, Sandy Hook and I think that um, 
that approach has really had a negative effect on students and it's led to a lot of incidents of police brutality as opposed to protecting students because it's not getting at the root of the issue, it's just adding more of a police presence that is, is unnecessary in that instance at least. Vandeep? I'm sort of adding on to what everyone said. I think it's very important for um, mental health services to kind of meet the needs of like our new generation, which they're doing um, very well in like the Fox Valley, like we have NAMI and we have all these other organizations. Um, and as well as clarifying again about like the potential um, shooters comment, um, I think that mental health checks, um, they're not like used to potentially identify um, shooters so much as like where I was going with that, just to clarify was that I believe that there should be mental health checks done before you purchase a firearm, just to make sure um, you won't hurt yourself or others with it because a lot of people um, uh, use firearms um, in suicides and I know that accounts for 50% of like gun deaths. And I believe that in order to have a gun, it should be made sure that you won't use it to hurt yourself or others. Um, so that's, that's where I was kind of going with that, um, just to make sure people will not hurt themselves with a firearm. I feel like a mental health check is something that should be used. Um, in general with mental health, I feel like, again, as Ishani sort of stated, it should be destigmatized and we should be able to promote mental health services to all like students and just generally everyone in the community. And wouldn't it be wonderful to take the stigma away from mental illness too? This will be our last question. Okay. Great, I have two questions. <laughs> but they're both really, really short. Um, I, I get that we're the League of Women Voters and we are always saying we're nonpartisan, so I'm not surprised that nobody touched on this. But kind of following up on, on your 10-year thing before, in 10 years, where would you like to see America politically? And in 10 years, what would be your perfect mode of transportation? Is it even a car? <laughs> Anybody want to take that one on? Mandeep, do you want to? Sure, so I'd really like to see um, sort of a legislature that isn't gridlocked and can um, pass laws more efficiently. Um, and I think that'd be really beneficial to reforms and systematic changes that we've been talking about um, throughout this hour. Um, and I think my favorite mode of transportation would probably be either like teleportation or high-speed rail, if we could do something <laughs> like that. Thank you. Yeah, in 10 years politically, I would really like to see a shift in just how we elect officials instead of doing like a winner takes all type of thing that instead we're doing more rank choice voting. Yeah. I think, yeah, yeah. Um, that would just promote more civility in our elections that promotes more one-on-one -on -one contact with candidates and it also just prevents that gridlock that's happening um, and just sends a more unified front. And I think as for transportation, I mean, I'm thinking like bus, trains, things like that. I also love to ride a bike, so. I mean, I honestly like don't know where I would want our political state to be in 10 years, like very honestly. I don't know what I think would be best for the country because, you know, we haven't really like changed in quite a while. Um, so yeah, I think it'd be really hard to say actually. Um, and then in terms of modes of transportation, exactly what Ivy said, you know, bikes. Um, <laughs> and then like a high speed rail maybe, or um, teleportation, you know, flying cars. We haven't gotten those yet, so. Yeah, um, first of all, just um, uh, Mandeep, I'm very like, I appreciate what you said about mental health checks and I definitely like agree with that. That was just like another thing that was on my mind. Like, what do we think of potential shooter is I think like in terms of America um, 10 years from now um, definitely an end to gerrymandering that would be great um, <laughs> and I think also just 
being more open to more progressive ideals. Like, I think a lot of, like, younger progressive candidates are, like, branded as radical, and then we see radical as a bad thing. You know, things like universal health care, having, like, quick and effective climate policy. Like, these things should not be radical, and I think they deserve a voice in the conversation. Um, in terms of transportation, I'm a big train fan, love trains. Um, yeah, high-speed rail would be great. <laughs> I, I, I don't like driving. I also think just having more walkable cities or having like protected bike lanes would also be very cool. Well, that was our last question, but there is a comment. And okay. I didn't say our last comment. <laughs> Good afternoon, all. I'm Karen Nelson, League of Women Voters, Milwaukee County. I just wanted to clarify, since I have left uh, the mayor's office here in the city of Appleton and moving into the world of behavioral health, that I would like to invite us to uh, intentionally focus on the word mental health and not mental illness. The word mental illness can be stigmatizing as well. So I just wanted to clarify that uh, as we are moving into the new lingo of supportive well-being words such as mental health. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And can we just give these four young women a round of applause? And And thank you all. I think our future is in good hands. Well, Jean just took the words right out of my mouth. Our future is in good hands. I just have a few quick, quick announcements. Um, at this time, we get to say goodbye to our online audience. Thank you for hanging in with us all day. Our, um, our virtual attendees will receive a survey in the coming days to tell you, tell us about your experience. For those of you who are participating here in person, in your folder on yellow paper, you will find a paper survey that we would love you to return to the table outside of the um, doors tomorrow after we conclude or if you're leaving today, today. Um, the, uh, Next on our agenda is our um, social reception. So I invite all of you who are here in person to um, go down the hall to where we checked in that area. There will be a cash bar, some light appetizers, and finally, the celebratory 100-year birthday cake we've been waiting for for two years um, will be cut. Um, and then I do want to point out that Appleton has invested in the um, panel exhibits that are the We Stand on Their Shoulders, A History of Wisconsin's Women. So please do take a moment to read through those um, wonderful captions of who we are and our history. Um, this evening, we will all have a network, an opportunity to network in, at the social hour. Um, you'll, all the board members will be there, all the staff will be there, including our newest staff member, Maria Douglas. So for those who haven't had a chance to interact with her yet, she'll be there. Um, this evening, dinner is on your own. So after the social reception, um, please use the, the restaurant list in your um, folders to identify a minority-owned restaurant here in the Appleton Fox Cities area um, to make yourself happy. Um, and then as a reminder, tomorrow morning, breakfast will be served starting in this room at 8 a.m. By 8.30, we'd like to be dividing up into networking sessions. You can feel free to bring your breakfast to the networking session. Um, the rooms are all in your um, packet, and um, so you can feel free to figure out where you want to go. The topics for networking, we've kind of divided it into a couple of biggies. Um, there'll be a, a group of local league presidents who can network with one another, our voter services um, folks, our DEI folks, the technology and communications folks, and then um, legislative committee members will be available for those of you who might um, have some questions about what they're up to. Um, alrighty, all of that is in the packet. We look forward to seeing you down the hall and again tomorrow morning. Yes, you may announce. Okay, I'm not even gonna attempt last names. I'm going to announce who won the silent auction. 
I will be at a table right there. You can stop and pay me. And I've got Diane, Renee, Ellen, Diane again, Joan, Diane again. Thank you very much. Sue, Maria, Teresa, Renee again, Christy, Maria, Libby, Karen, and Ellen. If you're unsure, if there's more than one of you with that name, if you didn't sign up, it's not you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Please join us for the social reception. Bye.